Welcome to the OSA class, WASP, Project 205, Ship Brief. All right, so what is the OSA? The OSA comes in two variants, OSA 1, OSA 2. Uh, they're very similar, uh, but we will go over the exceptions later on. But the base design for OSA 1 uh, is 220 tons, so pretty light craft. It is a Corvette. 127 feet long, 25 feet wide, which seems kind of wide for a ship like this, but that's what the sources say. Uh, we're going to go with that for now. Uh, they have three M503 engines, and these uh, provide 4,000 horsepower apiece. Uh, those will be upgraded for the OSA 2. That's one of the things that does change. But they all have three shafts. Uh, OSA 1s can do 38 knots with these diesel engines, and they fire four Styx anti-ship missiles. They do have uh, one SAN-5 SAM launcher that's li literally a man pad. Think of a Stinger missile uh, for the NATO armies, but this is the Russian version of it. So they can stick a, a Comrade topside with a shoulder-launched you know, surface-to-air missile, very short range, and that's their air defense. <laughs> Uh, but they also had, they do have two Sea Whiz in the earlier one. It's the AK-230, 30 millimeters. Uh, that's the two-barrel uh, self-defense one. And they have a crew of 28 people and 1,800 nautical mile range if they limit their speed to 18 knots and enough food and water on board for five days. All right, so construction of these. So this replaced an old uh, cruise or Corvette um, called the Comar class. We will not be going into the Comar class. Just know that this supersedes it. This replaces it. And these are all constructed in Vladivostok, Russia. So it's on the Pacific coast of Russia. And uh, they build over 400 of these things there. Pretty incredible. So the hull where you see the 725 painted, that's all steel. But everything above that, the superstructure where the crew sits and the bridge there, that's all a lightweight alloy. Uh, they use, like I said, the M503 radial diesel engines. Radial diesels are very high RPM and can have high power uh, in a compact design. So that's why they went with that. And there you go. Here's a picture of Vladivostok's shipyard. There are lots of shipyards in this area, but this is the, the primary one. And they do a lot of work here. This one pumped out over 400 of the ships we're talking about today. All right, so here's the SN2 Styx missile. Uh, extremely old school, uh, 1950s design, 60s, you know, employment, uh, and, you know, very easy to, to trick with electronic warfare, as we will see coming up. But here you go. Here you can see a technician working on what looks to be like the guidance system behind the radar dish there in the nose. And uh, this is a very interesting picture with it taken apart like this. It does have about a 20 mile range. And it is subsonic. They're shooting four of these for each of our ships today. Here's the SAN-5 Strela surface-to-air missile. Literally a guy with a shoulder-mounted uh, you know, man pad, we call him. This is has an IR seeker. It can only be shot at uh, regressing or egressing, rather, uh, aircraft. In other words, it has to have a stern or aft aspect. It has to be looking at the engine output uh, in order for it to get a good lock. And then it quickly catches up to the uh, airplane before it gets outside 3.4 kilometers. It does have an impact fuse and a high explosive warhead. Here's that AK-230 I was telling you about. This is the predecessor to the 630. They had these first. And it's just basically two barrels ripping out, you know, a thousand rounds or it's a thousand rounds total. It's 500 rounds per barrel per minute. Uh, each one carries 1000 rounds and can shoot down uh, an air target out to four kilometers and ballistic max range is six kilometers. So this can be used for both uh, anti-air defense or, you know, a anti-ship weapon. Here's the OSA 2. This is the uh, big brother of it. This is the one that they uh, improved and basically they just put better engines on it. And added a quad launcher for the SAN-5. Now, for the life of me, I couldn't find a quad launcher photo. But uh, because they called it a quad launcher, I assume they took it off the man's shoulder and had a little pop-up turret that would uh, have four SAN-5s inside of it. But like I said, could not find a photo of it extended. So it might be that they just have four SAN-5 shoulder <laughs> launch uh, SAMs, you know, stowed away somewhere. Um they're not very clear on that, but they do have a quad launcher now. 
and uh, much faster engines. The uh, This is the M504 radial diesel from the M503, pushing them to 42 knots, and they increased the crew members by one up to 29. And these were exported everywhere. Um, both the OSA 1 and the OSA 2 all over the world. And Wikipedia has a very comprehensive list of all these nations. I'll make this photo available to the Patreons in the photo section for this uh, ship brief. I'm not going to sit here and read it to you. But as you can see, they exported all over the place from, you know, Europe to Asia, you name it. And this is just the OSA 1. This is the OSA 2. Just as many exports, just as many countries very extensively used around the world. And this is one of the few ships we get to talk about that actually saw combat during the Cold War. So we're going to talk about a couple of battles that they had. Uh, this one is the Battle of Latakia. This is October 7th, 1973 in the Mediterranean near Syria. So this is part of that uh, Yom Kippur War. If you guys remember that, Syria uh, launched eight sticks missiles that outranged the um, Israeli Gabriel missiles by about 12 kilometers. So Syria had the range advantage and fired their missiles at maximum range towards uh, the SAR class uh, frigates or corvettes that, that Israel had. Every one of them was defeated by electronic warfare and chaff. So this early you know 1950s design 1960s built uh missile seeker head is extremely vulnerable to electronic warfare this is what the syrians found out the hard way on the battlefield so after they expended their missiles the israelis closed to within gabrielle anti-ship missile range that they had unsunk a bunch of them so the missile not very effective if your target has electronic warfare on October 8th and 9th, 1973, uh, this is the Battle of Baltim off the coast of Egypt. And um, there are six Israeli missile boats, again, with electronic warfare you know, ready and transmitting. There's four Egyptian Osas to the west of their position, closing rapidly. Um, the electronic warfare that the Israelis used were able to multiply the appearance of their ships from, you know, six to like 10 or 12, literally doubling the radar signature of what the Egyptians were seeing and what the missiles were seeing too. So there was a good chance that the missile that locked onto a target was a fictitious target, just didn't even exist. That was one of the many capabilities Israel had back in 1973 with their electronic warfare, very advanced for the time. And it worked. So Egypt, not repeating the mistakes that the Syrians made the day before, uh, just did a first strike of only two missiles to see if what would happen. And sure enough, both missiles were decoyed by chaff and just splashed down into the water. So they did three more salvos over the next 10 minutes, maintaining uh, outside Gabrielle missile range in that 12 kilometer window advantage, range advantage that they had with the Israelis kind of bouncing in and out of that. So they could shoot their missiles that had a longer range at maximum range and then retreat again. And uh, all three uh, salvos were, were decoyed and splashed into the water, completely ineffective against Israeli electronic warfare. And then again, Israelis with the faster boats uh, caught up to the uh, Egyptians eventually and sank three Osas and had an unconfirmed kill on the fourth one. So again, a major victory for the Israeli Navy. Gabriel missile hits their targets in large part because the OSA doesn't have any kind of electronic warfare system. There's no, well, the only chance they have is to actually shoot it down with their uh, AK 230s or, you know, the lucky man pad guy up on the top, you know, maybe shooting it down with a uh, SAN five. But remember that SAN five needs a rear aspect. And whenever missiles coming at you, you don't have a rear aspect to that engine. So that is very unlikely to happen. Operation Trident. So this is between India and Pakistan, 1971. This is well, this was a night attack. So on the night of uh, December 4th into the early morning of December 5th, uh, India sets up five ships, three Osas and two Pecha threes um, in northern India territory, and they wait for sunset to go down. 
Up north of them is a Pakistani uh, patrol, a, a flotilla, if you will. And they're staying in Pakistani waters. Well, around 10 p.m., you know, the sun's firmly set at this point. It's, it's all dark. Uh, the Indians begin racing north. And they get their first radar contact at 70 nautical miles. The Pakistanis are being tracked now. They close to 20 nautical miles where the Indian ship uh, Nergant fires a Styx missile at the um, PNS ship Kaibar. Kaibar does not have electronic warfare or did not employ it. And it was hit by the Styx missile, disabling her. Uh, the, the Indians, after doing some battle damage assessment, realized the ship was not sinking and uh, shot a second st sticks missile at her, and that one hit, and it did sink her. So K bar is now gone. Of course, radio messages are going out. Pakistan Navy's trying to figure out what's going on. But in the confusion, another OSA, the Nimpat, fires two sticks missiles at uh, an ammo ship, a ship containing you know re reloads and uh, lots of ammunition, and that ship simply explodes whenever it gets hit with a sticks missile. There's nothing left of this ship. It takes all 33 crew with her in a big fireball, mushroom cloud in the middle of the night. And then finally, uh, there's a minesweeper left now undefended uh, from the military escort that it once had, uh, presumably trying to disengage, but it was uh, sank with a Styx missile. So this was a very successful use of the OSAs and the Styx missiles in a surprise attack at night against ships that did not have electronic warfare or chaff was not effectively employed, um, presumably because they didn't realize they were under attack by the missile. They probably saw the ship's radars, we assume, uh, but maybe they didn't have the uh, technology to recognize that an incoming anti-ship cruise missile was on the way and therefore launched chaff. Uh, that's a little speculation on my part. I can't otherwise justify how they would, didn't defeat these missiles. But in this case, they were three for three uh, with uh, three sunk. All right, the Iran-Iraq War is the last example that we have. This was the tanker war that happened during the 1980s. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth. It was a very bloody war, an artillery war, Soviet-style tactics on both sides of the Iran-Iraq border on the land side. But on the sea side, they were always looking for uh, tankers to either capture or sink. And so Iranian F-4s, Phantoms, uh, would patrol out with Maverick missiles and uh, look for Iranian flagged or ported tankers and attack them. Well, this on this day, on the 29th of November, 2000, or 1980, rather, uh, they found an OSA. And the OSA was destroyed with a Maverick missile with absolutely no counterfire to the F-4. It was simply a matter of getting to within, you know, five or six miles overhead and shooting a Maverick missile down on top of it. And the OSA was hit. So... The OSA does not have very good point defense. It has no electronic warfare. It is a one-shot willy in terms of having only four missiles. It does have high speed, so it can race in, shoot, and get out. So it's a great surprise tactic ship. And so if I had to, you know, put together my final thoughts on this, I would say this is a very successful export ship. It's a very good offensive platform for the 1960s. Um, but once they got into the 70s and the age of, uh, you know, electronic warfare, augmenting missile warfare, um, this this the S the SSN2 Styx missile was quickly outdated. They they needed a new missile for it. So, um, and another thing about this uh, ship is that it was very easy to build and cheap to sell. So. You know, smaller countries that didn't need a blue water navy, but did need a coastal defense uh, like, you know, Romania, Bulgaria, you know, just all the, the smaller countries that have smaller coastlines in comparison to like the United States. Right. As a very large coastline, if they just need basically a border patrol to enforce, you know, their their sea borders, this is a great option for them. And in the 1960s, it was very effective, but it quickly got outdated. Uh, by technology advancements in the 70s and going forward from that. And like I said before, it was sold everywhere. Uh, everywhere from Africa to Europe to Asia bought these ships. They're all over the place. Uh, some of these are still on ship rosters. However, it's highly unlikely that they're seaworthy. Um, I know uh, countries like North Korea are notorious 
for just tying a ship or submarine to the pier and with no intention of ever sailing it again, but keeping it on the roster so it bolsters the numbers of their Navy, you know. And that's probably the case with any of these remaining ones. All right, well, that's it for the Osa. Another quick one. This 